Hello, all you inquisitive YouTube people. I am Chris Lucas, and this is uh, my little uh, probably not short primer on how to edit drums. Uh, what's been going on with me? Uh, a lot. I just finished the Sirion EP, which sounds killer, and you should check it out. I'm going to put it in the description of this video. And uh, I opened a little studio. Actually, the keyboard player of Sirion offered to build me a little studio if I would run it in Burbank, and I said, of course. So that just opened, rosensound.com. Check it out. Book time. I'll make your stuff sound awesome. Uh, but to drums, 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 drums are, drums are interesting. The first step in editing drums really is to track the drums well. And that's, sounds a little obtuse, and it is, but that's because it really is important. If you have a drummer who cannot play in time, you're never really going to get the product that you want. You can make it work, sort of, but if it's over a certain threshold of crappy, it's just not going to be salvageable. Now, what is that threshold? Well, that kind of depends on your skill level editing and, more importantly, the amount of patience you have. Because you can cut stuff in, you know, four beats at a time for a whole song, but you're going to want to kill yourself at the end. So, with that being said, take the time during tracking to get a lot of takes to, you know, do whatever it takes to make the drummer play right, all right? All right, so now that we've hopefully recorded the drums well, um, you need to comp the drums together. Now, comping the drums together essentially just means that you take the best part of each take and you go through the song and you just cut them all together. Now, there are some, you can do it and we'll have to do it more or less to a large or small extent depending on how good the drummer is, but there are some tips overall that can help you make it sound as transparent as possible. The number one tip is, Make your edits on very obvious transients that obscure the edit. So if there's a cymbal crash or something, make it on that and not in the middle of a cymbal ring out where you can hear the obvious change from one take to another. That way it's just more transparent. So if you listen to all these little areas where I've already comped this together, I've already edited and comped this, so I'm just using this as an example, um, you won't be able to hear these edits with all of it soloed and no, basically no processing on it. So in the track, they're definitely going to be completely transparent. Check it out. And on and on. And on and on. So that's basically what you want them to sound like. Transparent, two millisecond crossfade, something very small in there just to keep it so there's no pops or anything, obviously. Make sure to always crossfade regions when you're editing, in case you didn't know that. One thing you're going to want to look out for when you're comping together drum tracks is a scenario like this. So say you've got a part of a song and you really love the take the drummer did, but he's just slamming on a ride cymbal or something, just really crashing on the ride, and you really love the take, but there's a fill in there and he just totally eats it, and it's awful and you just can't use it. You can't edit, it's way too bad to edit, so he just drops a stick or something. So you might say, okay, well, go to one of the other takes. You know, you, talk, you took a lot of takes and get the fill from that take. Well, say in every other take, he was not riding on the, on the ride cymbal. He was riding on something else. Well, when you cut in that other fill from that other take, it's gonna be really obvious you made an edit because you're gonna go from that really loud prominent ride cymbal or really any cymbal, cymbals are all pretty loud, to a completely different one with a completely different tonality with a completely different volume, and it can sound really unnatural. Now, what do you do? Well, you can't really do anything, which is why I bring up the fact that you should really make sure that you get it right in tracking. But the reality is, it's 2014, most people don't know the damn difference, and if it sounds good in the context of the song, that's all that really matters. If you listen to any modern metal production, you'll hear drum edits, especially with guys who can't really play drums. You'll hear a lot of drum edits, and you'll hear fake cymbal hits edit and all sorts of crap. Do what's right for the song, and just make it sound cool. That's really the only thing you have to worry about. But that's why I really stress the tracking part, because if you can get a drummer to get in there and a do a ton of takes and do a ton of takes consistently, especially in terms of what parts they're playing, you'll be able to just pick and choose from the best fills, the best little things, and it'll just be way better because of that. Now that I've said my piece about comping drums and you've consolidated the regions and everything's sitting pretty, it's time to get down to the edits. But before we do that, there are a few little things you can do to make your life a little easier. Now, you should group the tracks, obviously. They should, I mean, from comping them, it should all be in one group, really. And then you add two more groups, and I'll explain why a little later. But for now, I'll explain just what the groups are. One is just the kicks. And I say kicks because in this case, I used multiple microphones on the kick drum. If you only use one, you don't really technically need to make this group. 
And then I also have a group with everything that's not kick drum. Again, if you only use one mic on the kick drum, you don't really have to make this group. I'll explain why later. So we also want to do something just to make our lives a little easier. It saves me some time. Stack all the relevant transient tracks. So at least one track of the kick drum, one track of the snare drum, uh, the overheads, toms, hi-hat and ride, any of the major tracks and stack them on top of each other so you can see it all at the same time. So you can see all the relevant transient information where anything the drummer could be hitting, you can all see it right here without scrolling up and down. It just makes your life a little easier. And I found that in the past, I found myself scrolling up and down trying to find like, oh, where's this Tom hit? Oh, I didn't hear that. Or some things I'll, I'll just be editing and zone out and I will, like, won't hear Tom hits because I'm actually thinking about something else. And then I won't edit them and I'll go back and be like, oh yeah, it feels wrong. Whoops. So it's, it's the little things that help you in the long run. So now we want to set each track's elastic audio state to be correct. Now, in this case, you want to set them basically as rhythmic and polyphonic, and I'll tell you which why. You want to set all the close mics, or all the mics that are directly on drums, essentially, so not overheads or cymbal mics of any kind, to rhythmic. Rhythmic is the mode that works best with close mic drums and is going to sound the most transparent, is going to keep the drum hits intact and not stretch them and do weird things for the most part, it's gonna sound really good. Now, the reason you wanna use polyphonic on the overhead tracks, I've found from doing it, is that rhythmic, if you move the cymbal hits or other things a little far, it can sound kinda obvious and it just doesn't sound as good to me as polyphonic mode. Now, you might ask, why don't you use X form or monophonic on the cymbal tracks and whatnot? And there's a very good reason that I haven't seen a lot of people talk about. And that reason is X form and monophonic, from what I can tell, from what I've done, do not retain your phase relationship between tracks at all um, a lot of the times and can make things totally destroyed on a drum set to the point where if you have both the overhead tracks on X form, and you make a warp marker somewhere and they're grouped, you know, and you move them both the same amount, it will totally screw up their phase relationship during that edit and will totally destroy the stereo image of your tre of your overheads, which in turn destroys that phase relationship with the close mics, which can make your close mic hits during those edits sound weird in a non-predictable way. So that's why I really, 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 really recommend not using X-Form for drum edits. If you're editing something that's just one thing by itself that you're never gonna have to worry about its phase relationship with anything else in the whole world, go for it. But other than that, don't. That's just what I've found. So now that you've got all your tracks set to the right elastic audio state, we can actually start moving, moving notes. Now, say, let's just take, for instance, this first few eight or ten bars of this song. Let's listen to it, and then we'll go back and I'll edit it and I'll show you how I did it. So listen to this. So not bad at all, again, because we comped it together and got the best takes possible and put them together. But things are not exact. Now, in this genre of music, which is just straight ahead metalcore, I'm gonna make everything exact. A lot of people would argue with that. A lot of people would say, man, drummers, like, they, they got, like, feel, and, like, I want to keep that feel, bro. I get that. I play drums. But let's be honest. If you're playing a genre of music or recording a genre of music where the drummer is allowed to have feel and you're doing a bunch of drum edits, that drummer doesn't have feel worth keeping. So, I mean, just think of it that way. Do the edits, make it sound right, do what it takes to make the song good. You know what I'm saying? So let's start with this. I take this first drum hit. Now, if you just try to grab a hit and move it right now, it's gonna move every friggin' thing in the track. Look at this. I try to move this hit, try to move this hit. This one's off, try to move this one. A whole track moves. That's not helpful. Now, you can say, well, I'll just, if you shift click on a hit, it adds warp markers at the next and previous warp marker. But in this, with, the problem with holding shift and doing this is so when two hits align very closely like this and you say you want to take this snare hit and you want to move it right to the beat. If you shift click this snare hit, it's going to make warp markers at this kick hit right before it. And it's not going to let you drag this hit to the left. That's not helpful. So in this case, this is why I like to go through and just double click on each thing and drag it one at a time. Now, how do you keep everything from moving? What I like to do is I like to just go, you know, eight or 10 or 12 bars in, whatever, and just make a warp marker on something. 
And that way I know nothing past that warp marker is gonna move. And then I just go in like this by hand and I take each of these hits and I just friggin' drag them where they're supposed to be. That's just it. I mean, it sounds stupid, but I just sit here all day and I just do this, you know? Look, Phil, 16 notes. Now, sometimes it misses a warp marker, like in this case. Now, to do this, I'm just left-clicking and dragging slightly. It's in grid mode. I know what subdivision I want to be on. I just generally set it to a higher subdivision than I need, and I just run with that. And I basically just go through all these hits and edit them. And eventually, as I get through the entire song, like I said, so that you can see that transient there, didn't have a warp marker, I had to add it. Same with this one here, doesn't have a warp marker, I'll add one. You gotta watch out for those things. And that's why it's important to visualize all this stuff right here. Obviously, use your ears, but for the most part, they're drum hits. You can see if they happen or not in time. If they're really obscure, it probably means the drummer wasn't hitting very hard, and uh, that's a whole separate problem. So basically, at the end of all this, it's gonna look basically like this. A lot of edits. And as you can hear, Not very obvious that they're edited, especially in the context of a mix. So as you can see, you can get away with a lot. Everything in this is metronomically perfect. And that's okay, you know? If it's what the song needs, uh, go for it. So that's really all it amounts to, although there are a few problems you can run into, and I'm gonna show you how to get around those problems right now. So a common problem that a lot of people have is areas where a drummer will be hitting two things at the same time, be it a kick and a snare, especially in metal is common because you're doing so much double kick stuff, a lot of kicks and snares land at the same time, and the drummer won't have played them at the same time in real life, like that hit I was looking at earlier. So like for here instance, these are just straight 16th note kicks or 8th note kicks, and these snare hits and this kick hit, this snare hit and this kick hit and this snare hit and this kick hit were all supposed to land at the same time. Well, if I move, if I move, let's just put these kick hits where they're supposed to be really quick. Um, if I move these kick hits here, and I move this snare hit here, this kick hits off, and I can't, I can't move it. Well, what do you do? Well, if you just play it back like this, it's gonna sound weird because that kick hit's gonna just sound totally wrong. So, how do you fix that? Well, this is why we made the other two groups. Now, in this case, what I'll do is I'll unclick my drum group. I will undo this warm mark on the kick track, and I will separately take this kick hit out of phase with every other drum track and I will line it up with the snare. And as you listen now, it will sound right. Now, if you listen very carefully in the overheads and the kick track together, you'll be able to hear it. But it's very subtle. And again, in the context of a mix, no one is hearing that. I guarantee it. Now. In this song and these drums, I asked the drummer to specifically focus on making sure that he hit the drum hits when he hit kicks and snares at the same time and cymbals and snares and stuff at the same time. He landed them together. And honest to God, for 90% of this, all these hits were perfect. And I am so happy because you can do this to a certain extent. You can move kick hits separate from everything else. But if you start doing it all the time, it is going to start getting noticeable. Now, the reason I move the snare hit to the grid with the rest of the tracks and then move the kick hit separately is because the kick doesn't really come through in any of the ambient tracks. I mean, it does, but for the most part, you're rolling off the low end of the overhead, so the kick isn't really going to come through. In genres of music where the dr there's less going on, it you can hear the ambience of the drums better, you're not going to be able to get away with this. But in a genre of music like this, especially when you're using sample replacement, do it. Nobody's going to be able to tell. Um, but I reuse the snare to be the main track that I move because the snare has a much more important relationship with the overheads and rooms than the kick track. If you move a snare hit out of phase with the overheads and rooms, it's going to be really obvious because the overheads, for the most part, contribute a lot to the overall sound of the snare drum. And you're really going to notice if that contribution gets washed away because you move the track independent of the overhead. Another problem you can run into that's common, that's a lot harder to fix, uh, but still sort of fixable, is if a drummer hits the snare drum and a cymbal not together. Now, this is a problem because you can't really adjust either of them independent of one another because it's gonna be obvious no matter what. 
So what I generally do is I just look through this entire track and I couldn't find a single case where he hit a snare drum and a cymbal not pretty together. But here's a case where it's sort of showable. I move this snare hit right here exactly on the beat. Technically, this cymbal hit on these overheads is a little behind. And if it was more obvious, it would be, they'd show another warp marker or you'd just be able to hear it. What I would do in this case is I would make the snare hit on and then I would take the cymbal track and I would just holding Apple so that it or command so that it doesn't so that it ignores the grid which by the way pro tip hold apple it ignores the grid i would just drag that in until it turned red and then i'd turn it back that'll help drag it a lot closer closer and it'll make it a lot less obvious that the hem symbol and snare hit did not land together especially again in the case of sample replacement because it's going to crush that snare hit a little bit but if you're replacing with samples always take samples of the kit and tracking by the way always always um, that way you can just replace it with a sample or even copy paste in a hit there and it won't be noticeable at all. All right, that's about it for editing drums. I mean, uh, the only things that you'll run into other than that is knowing what the drummer was go supposed to be playing so that you know what to edit it to. Um, I'm going to be honest, I don't know if I'm a good person to teach that, because I've played drums for a really long time, I've read music for a really long time, so I don't really think about it when I edit, I just kind of imagine myself playing it, and I, I know what to make it. So for that, I would just say, if you're not familiar with rhythms and the way rhythmic notation works and the way rhythms are broken down, I would just go get like a beginning textbook, go to your local community college, honestly, seriously, I mean, that's what I would do. It, uh, it's what I'm gonna do for computer science stuff for the future. Go to community college, take a class, beginning music theory class, learning about the rhythms. Because if you don't know that stuff, it's going to make your life way harder. So first step, more than anything, get that fundamental knowledge. There's nothing more important in any of this stuff than understanding the way it all works, the way it's all laid out, and you know the fundamental principles behind all of it. Because if you're trying to add drums and you don't know the difference between an eighth note and an eighth note triplet and a sixteenth note and a thirty-second note, you're not going to have a good time and it's going to be a real pain in the ass. So with that said, I hope you've learned something. I hope uh, I hope next time you edit drums, it goes a lot smoother for you. Uh, or if it's your first time, it goes swimmingly. And I hope uh, you can make uh, drummers who can't play sound like they're perfect. Because that's, that's the goal, I guess, at the end of the day, right? Make it perfect. Make it awesome. Perfect for the song. Not just perfect. Perfect for the song. So uh, again, check out my studio, rosensound.com. Uh, come by. Check it out. We'll talk. Seriously, like anytime you want to learn some stuff, come by. We'll talk. Um, and uh, I'm going to make a little blog. This will be the first post of the blog. And I just want to, you know, promote the business, do little tutorials, do little audio myth busting. Uh, and if you have any, you know, suggestions for little tutorials I could do, I think I want to do one for guitar and bass editing as well because those are, you know, really important. And a lot of people don't really talk about that. Drum editing, everybody talks about, but guitar and bass, nobody really talks about. And especially in a uh, musical context like this, it's, uh, it's really important. So uh, I hope you